Hey everybody and welcome to my channel. So very recently I released a video about Dr. Barry Harris and his teachings and then I pretty quickly took it down. So on my channel I take all of your comments and opinions really really seriously and some people pointed out that there are some ways in which I could have really improved the way I was teaching about Dr. Harris's methodology. So he's a really really interesting figure because unlike some of the other people who I've covered in my How to Sound Like the Great series, Dr. Harris actually had an extremely profound and very, very deep methodology that he taught throughout his life. So he's a very unique case in that sense, and so it's really important to um, make sure that his teachings are portrayed with accuracy and done justice. So hopefully this new version of the video is going to do just that. I do want to give you just a quick heads up that nonetheless this video is going to be a survey style video, so this is introducing you to his concepts. Um, and there's also some, you know, partiality, some subjectivity based on my own experience. Throughout the video, I might also shout out a couple videos that I found really helpful as well, just for specific spots where I think you might want to dive a little bit more deeply into the methodology. With that said, let's dive right into it. So a really great place to start and where I think a lot of folks who teach Dr. Harris's techniques tend to start is with a scale called the sixth diminished scale. So that scale looks like this. It is essentially a C major scale in this case, because we're in the key of C, but with a flat six added. So the way Dr. Harris explains this scale is it's actually made up of a C major six chord and also a D diminished chord, right? So we're not thinking of this scale in terms of just the notes inside it in a sequence. We're actually thinking of it as being made of these two different tonalities, right? These two make up that scale. And simply by thinking of it in this way, suddenly a world of new ideas and viewpoints exists to us. Well, first of all, we see that because a diminished chord is built perfectly through the octave, just in minor thirds, right? It breaks the octave perfectly into these four separate pieces. We essentially have these diminished chords that move up the scale, um, or rather up the keyboard. And we can really do the same thing here with inversions of the C major six chord, right? Again, in the key of C here. And so a lot of us wonder, how do we practice block chords? Well, this is where this concept comes from. We can actually practice moving our block chords up the six diminished scale, and every other note lands on a diminished chord. So that's a really, really great way to practice these block chords. Now, what about block chords on a minor scale? Um, well, there's actually a minor six diminished scale, which Dr. Harris also introduces us to, and we can practice block chords over that too. So that scale looks like this. And it's a lot like a, uh, it's a, lot like a melodic minor scale, but with a flat six added, right? So if we take block chords over this scale, we get our awesome block chord sound in the minor tonality. This is a really common way to practice block chords as well for minor. So that's really, really awesome. Now, in addition to that, of course, we can then do what are called drop two versions of these chords. So we take this little uh, C major six chord right here, or just C six. We're gonna remove the left hand here. We're gonna take the second note from the top, the A, and put it in the bottom. And now we just continue to move up that scale again. And in this case, we're doing major again. You can also do it for minor. And that works really, really nice and gives us these fantastic ways to practice block chords and drop two voicings for piano. By the way, so I actually wrote everything that I'm talking about in this video out for you, um, and I'm sharing that with all of my Discord members, so if you wanna check that out, you can join our Discord in the free link in the description. So in my last video, I talked about the continuous scale exercise, which I really, really like for forming lines over songs and really getting the sound of a song in your ear. All that exercise essentially is, is we take each scale that corresponds with, with each chord of a song and we connect seamlessly from chord to chord, from scale to scale. So instead of starting the scale, um, let, let's look at, at giant steps for a second. 
instead of starting the scale on the one of each scale, we use our ear to connect without any jumps, let's say bigger than a whole step. But this still just kind of sounds like scales, right? I mean, we're, we're, it sounds like one scale that we're just kind of molding, which is exactly what it is. It doesn't sound like bebop because for bebop, we need to add in approach notes and enclosures, these little tiny ways of approaching chord tones to help them land on those strong beats. Bebop lines, of course, are full of these. So Dr. Harris actually gives us some incredible rules that we can use to actually basically practice into our playing some beautiful lines that are gonna land those chord tones properly. So Dr. Harris introduces us to the added half step model um, for descending lines here. So when I personally teach the continuous scale method, I love to actually challenge people before they even start connecting their scales to start learning them from different degrees of the chords, right? So instead of just starting on one, I'll say, okay, start every scale on three. right? Um, and that's already helping your ears get to the next level. But that's not quite necessarily introducing us to great habits when it comes to sounding more beboppy at this point or introducing good habits for landing those core tones. Well, Dr. Harris has some fantastic solutions for that in his methodology. So essentially what he has is the added half step model for descending lines. So if we're taking a major tonality here, we already know that we can just take that normal sixth uh, diminished scale, right? That works great if we're descending starting on the one. So what if we want to start on the two? Well, we could do this. So that works really nicely. But what if we wanted some other options where we actually wanted to land on the three, for instance? Well, this is where those added half steps come in. So we're gonna add a half step between one and two here and between six and five, right? And again, all the numbers I'm talking about are in the key of C. So that gives us a really nice, more bebop sounding line, in my opinion. Now, Dr. Harris actually introduces us to rules for essentially starting on any different tone of the scale. Like here's another starting on the three. And we land on the five. And so in this one, we're adding a half step between two and one, between one and two, and between six and five. Now, one thing I like to do is actually encourage students to essentially use these concepts and come up with some of their own permutations. But again, as I described, Dr. Harris has rules for all of these. So if you wanna dive really, really deep into that, um, a couple of videos that I checked out a while back that I really, really loved are by YouTuber Bill Graham. So I'll link those in the description. Um, he goes through literally every different potential um, set of rules and shows you how to use them, and I think it's a really, really cool video. Now, a great way to apply this is we can take these rules, right, and go into a chord progression and figure out, let's say, maybe a, an arpeggio first and then go into a descending scale, right? And now we're creating licks. So for me, the really, really important takeaway here is that by practicing these rules with these um, scalar lines, Essentially what we're doing is creating good hearing habits for sounding, for achieving the bebop sound and actually, um, you know, building these essentially approach note or, you know, passing tone patterns into our ears. By the way, just a quick aside, if you are finding this video helpful, I always really, really appreciate you hitting that like button. So the way I see it, there are kind of two ways of looking at this, and this is getting into my opinions here and my own teaching methods. So just as a disclaimer, um, it's very interesting because you know Dr. Harris, of course, was such a, a prolific teacher. I, I wanna do my best to kind of clarify when I'm talking his methods and talking my methods, and I'm sure there are places in the video where I forgot to do that. But in my opinion, there are kind of two ways you could approach this. 
One, you could go through and learn every single possible rule that Dr. Harris gives us. Um, I think that's a fantastic thing to do and might be the best move, right? Um, if you're anything like me, you might prefer to do things a bit more by ear and just not always have the patience to learn everything from the theoretical perspective. So for me, I think it's also a great exercise to learn a few of these and then start figuring out how to use approach notes, right? So notes that are essentially passing tones that help us, you know, use a non-diatonic tone to land those chord tones or enclosures, little patterns around a chord tone to land those chord tones on strong beats and start to essentially create some of our own bebop vocabulary. I actually talk about this in some other videos, so maybe I'll link those as well. By the way, one other really cool concept that I want to mention here is called the family of four dominants. So this is really, really interesting and it gets back into that diminished chord theory here. So again, if we're in the key of C, um, we have that D diminished chord, or we could think of it as a B diminished chord, right? Same thing, all these minor thirds, same exact notes. And then if we take the five chord, that's our G, right? So a G7. Well, if we put B diminished here, we actually get a G7 with a flat nine. So G7 flat nine, right? It's a really, really nice sound. So that A flat is actually legitimately built into the sound of this C major tonality. But now here's what's really cool. If we lower any one of these notes, we actually get a different chord with a slightly different sound. So check this out. We lower the, the B, we get a B flat seven, and you put that over G, and essentially you've got actually a G seven with both a sharp nine and a flat nine, right? So that's an interesting sound. Let's go back to B diminished. If we lower this note by a half step, we are actually getting a D flat seven. Um, if we put that over G, I love that sound. So we're actually getting a G7 with a sharp 11 and a flat nine, right? And by the way, I love improvising using these different sounds and that's another thing that Dr. Harris mentions we can do. We can improvise with B flat. Resolve, right? So that's interesting. We could do D flat. Now I'm probably not improvising in the style that he would, but I'm just kind of going where my fingers take me with these tonalities. So I'm being a little bit more arpeggiated and pentatonic here. But if we did it more from the bebop perspective, some really, really nice sounds in our lines. All right, so now let's see what else we can get here. If we take this B diminished and lower the F here, we get an E7, put that over G, and we have G13 flat nine. Really nice sound. Again, recommend trying to put that in a lick, which could sound really cool. My own personal philosophy, I like to think of these as essentially dissonance formulas. So for me, I would literally just call this E7 over G7, right? And I would improvise in that way. But essentially, same kind of concept, right? And that right there is our family of four dominants, right? So if we lowered that last one, then we just have G7. So our four dominants are G7, uh, B flat seven, D flat seven, and E7. And that's like a really, really interesting sound, really fun to improvise with. So I'm just kind of alternating between them.
Now again, I am honestly just scratching the surface here. Um, Dr. Harris's teaching is an entire philosophy that I actually plan to learn a lot more about. There are some fantastic YouTubers that have dedicated their entire channels just to his teaching methods. If you wanna dive really deep in and check any of that out, check out Things I Learned from Barry Harris. Also, check out Labyrinth of Limitations. Those are two channels that I've been scouring over the last couple days and they're absolutely fantastic. There is also a wealth of information that he himself is giving us online. There are tons of masterclasses you can check out. Um, a couple of years ago, I remember, I went on a spree checking out his masterclasses and learned a lot about this stuff. And um, it's been really fun refreshing my memory and actually really thinking about how to apply this and then actually teach it. Because when you're learning to teach something, you quickly figure out what you really do and don't understand. Now, one other thing that I actually mentioned in my previous version of this video that I think is really, really important is Dr. Harris's energy as an educator and performer and how he would get the audience involved. So several years ago, I watched his Artist House Masterclass, which you can find right on YouTube. And it's always stuck with me, this little, um, uh, this, this little kind of performance technique he did where he actually you know, threw numbers on the ground and then randomly picked them up, created a melody, and just demonstrated what an incredible melodic developer he was. And I actually talked about this in my other video. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to go back to the other video. That's when my shirt's gonna suddenly change. Um, I think there were still some really useful elements in, that, in my first video that were now at this point, we are, we are getting away from Dr. Harris's teaching philosophy and techniques and getting into my observations in the typical way that I observe someone's playing, listen to their playing, and um, come up with ways for you to emulate it. So much like my other How to Sound Like the Greats videos in this series. So we're gonna switch back to that other video. We're gonna talk about Dr. Harris's performances. We're gonna talk about his melodic development and a few other observations I have about his chordal style, etc. Now, another really fantastic part of Barry's teaching that I find really, really important is melodic development. So I think that Barry was an absolute master of developing beautiful melodies based on simple melodic ideas, i.e. just basic thematic development, but really making something interesting out of it. One thing that I, you know, I got the sense was really important to Barry was actually having really fun performances, really um, connecting with the audience. And I think that, that that can be sometimes overlooked and it's certainly not something that he overlooked. And in this particular performance, what he did was he laid down flashcards on the ground and randomly picked them up. And they each had a number on, on each flashcard had a number on it, right? And so what he then did was he chose just four of them and put them in a random order, or even had someone from the audience choose four of them. So maybe it was, you know, five, seven, two, one. So that would be five, seven, two, one. So what Barry would do then is improvise a composition based on that melodic pattern. So let's say we're in C, right? Five, seven, two, one. He would actually come up with a melody. So he would actually say, I'm going to literally play a song called 5721, and based on that melodic segment, come up with a beautiful little tune. Now, I didn't do it nearly as well as he would do it, but that's kind of an example of what he would do. I think that this is such an important concept, and I'm actually gonna give you a way to practice this as well. Um, and so what you can do is you can actually take a single melodic segment and see if you can mold it through a tune. So let's say that that is our segment. So let's say, let's go to giant steps again. So we're gonna start on B um, major and we're gonna do five, seven, two, one. And here's what we're gonna do. We're going to see if we can take this little melodic theme and then change it as the chords change, just like we were doing continuous scale, but now with a little thematic melody. I didn't like that. 
also do that with a different type of melodic segment. Maybe it's just an arpeggiated segment, right? So maybe, let's see if we can arpeggiate this through giant steps. So that's a really, really cool way that we can practice that kind of melodic development so we can hear melodies moving through chord changes, just like Barry was so good at doing. One thing that I think he does really nicely and very, very musically is especially playing melodies with diatonic chords in his right hand. So he might play. So I think that's a really important skill to have. Um, for jazz piano in general. So, you know, we'll take, let's say, kind of a triadic harmony here and double the melody um, in the pinky and the thumb. And then we'll kind of move up a scale and get diatonic harmony here. So let's say right here I'm doing like the E flat major scale. So let's just let's just take a normal E flat triad here and you know double the octave. That's a really nice thing to do. And of course, we're just doing this over just E flat major, but if we did. And of course, I'm doing these little rolls. Um, I like to kind of roll up. But so that's, that's a really, really nice way of approaching playing a melody for solo piano. Now, I really feel like all in all, Barry's playing was a beautiful culmination of so many of the players that led up to um, his era, you know? So he had so much wonderful bebop vocabulary. He also used a lot of, you know, arpeggios over chords, something that, you know, Art Tatum and Oscar Peterson both did as well. So if we had a B flat dominant chord, might actually arpeggiate down that to land on a chord tone. So that brings us to the idea of, you know, when you're actually landing chord tones, you may actually want to come out of an arpeggio. Now, Barry also gives us some really nice arpeggios to use. So you might practice, you know, landing chord tones in a line or scale after arpeggiating something. Right? Now, if you want to get really, really into those details, again, search Bill Graham, uh, Barry Harris. He has some really nice detailed videos on that. Or just check out, you know, videos of Barry actually teaching this stuff. But what's really important about it for me here for the sake of this video, which is a bit more of like a general look at his playing, um, is the idea of practicing coming out of an arpeggio and then going into a line and landing it nicely. So whatever that arpeggio might be, So basically we start a line either descending, uh, sorry, descending or ascending with an arpeggio, right? And then we actually go into a line from that arpeggio and practice using those same techniques of enclosures and approach notes to then get out of it smoothly into a nice chord tone landing on a strong beat, so beat one or three. In terms of left hand comping, Barry also really kind of perfected um, a, a really beautiful standard jazz bebop vocabulary. So he would use a lot of tense. Um, so this is a really nice sound that a lot of people don't necessarily use as much as they could. So you might have one flat seven three. So it gives us a really nice um, way of doing this because we can do one flat seven three and then just resolve like that the uh, four down to the three of the five chord. 
whoop, so like this. And then we get one, seven, three for the major as well. So as you know, I love taking these videos and really exploring different concepts about a person's playing. These videos are meant to be a survey of concepts that you can immediately apply to your playing or simply understand so that when you actually listen to someone like Barry Harris's records, which are phenomenal, you can actually understand more what he's doing, maybe even recognize some of these techniques and some of these concepts. All in all, all I can say is I'm so thankful to the incredible treasure trove of educational materials and ideas that Barry left behind for all of us as jazz improvisers, pianists, and just people interested in improvised music in general. I hope this video serves as a really nice tribute to him and that you all can get some really nice value out of it. Most importantly though, you should absolutely, at the end of the day, start searching for videos of Barry himself teaching because if we're lucky for one thing, it's that he actually left behind so much incredible material for us um, to check out. So if you really want to make sure that your bebop playing is incredible, Barry Harris is the source where you should start. His teaching methods will help you understand bebop very, very deeply. And you know, having a deep understanding of bebop, I think is something really important for any jazz musician to do in the course of their learning. So big thank you to Barry Harris. Make sure you check out some of his master classes and performances online on YouTube, of course his records on Spotify. I hope you all enjoyed this tribute video. I definitely enjoyed making it for you and I really enjoyed even just the process of going back and listening to Barry and watching his master classes again, as I'm sure so many of us will be doing over the coming days. Now at the end of the day, I think different learning methods and different learning philosophies really affect each of us in different ways. So for me, I, for example, oftentimes think that teaching modes, the concept of modes, is really, really confusing to students. I think it makes way more sense to just say, okay, we have a scale called C Lydian and it sounds like this. It has a sharp four, it's C major with a sharp four. I want you to just hear that sound and understand it, right? That's that. So we, you know, we teach the scales from the common root, uh, the modes from a common root. So C Dorian versus C Lydian, right? The whole concept of how they're related to each other, I find sometimes is actually more useful to teach later rather than at first. But I think it's so wonderful to have philosophies that can combine and construe the incredible relationships that different chords and even all of the notes and different um, patterns of thinking have in music. That is what Dr. Harris's techniques do. And actually the deeper I dive into them, the more I realize what a beautiful, full kind of harmony there is about his teaching methodology. I hope that this video helps introduce a lot of folks to Dr. Harris's teaching and philosophy. Um, I didn't get to work with him personally, but there are those who did, and I highly recommend you explore his teaching online, his records, you know, on Spotify or wherever you like to listen, and you explore some of the, the channels of folks who got to go to his class regularly as well. That said, I will be back very soon with more content for you all. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.